Dr. Louise Durkin, who's um, a wildlife ecologist um, and researchers threatened terrestrial fauna. Um, she has a focus on the lead beaters possum and greater glider in relation to timber harvesting and forest ecology. Um, Lou also designs, designs and implements monitoring of amphibian and freshwater turtle communities to assess the impact of environmental watering. And today, Lou will discuss her work and findings on the search of Watson's tree frog in a post fire landscape using genetics to inform conservation management. So Lou's talk is in search of Watson's tree frog in a post fire landscape using genetics to inform conservation management. And unfortunately, Lou is sick today, but we do have Andy who is going to put her presentation up for us so that you can enjoy that. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming along. My name's Louise. I am an ecologist at the Arthur Ryler Institute or ARI. The other talks today have had have had a fairly broad view looking at um, ecosystems or multiple species or how we can make decisions. Uh, but I'm going to focus in on this single species uh, and fill you in on some of the recent work on this very enigmatic little creature, Watson's tree frog. So I'm going to cover a bit of uh, background of the story of what we know about this frog in Victoria and then uh, touch on some of the post fire field surveys and the genetics work that we've been up to the past year or so, as well as some of the next steps for the conservation management of the species. So this species, uh, Latoria Watson I, was actually only described a couple of years ago uh, or recognised as a species in 2020. So that, um, that study split the species that was previously called Latoria Little John I into two. Little John I is now found, uh, now known to be found around the Sydney area and Watson I in southeast New South Wales and into East Gippsland. Right, so all frogs um, previously called Little John I or Large Brown Tree Frog in Victoria are now known to be um, called Watson I, uh, which we've been calling Watson's Tree Frog increasingly since the redescription which I think is a, a bit of an improvement on the previously used common name, the large brown tree frog, which is a pretty uninspiring uh, name for such a cool frog. So basically when you hear either of these two names in Victoria, we're talking about the same thing. And Watson's tree frogs can be easily distinguished by that bright orange color on the back of their legs and in the groin and the armpits, as you can see in the photos I've got there. And the other really interesting thing about this frog is, um, when handled, the adults put out an exudate on their skin, which smells exactly like curry powder. So a lot of people know them as the curry, the curry frog. Uh, they're a forest dependent species, entirely forest dependent. Uh, they've never been detected outside of forested areas. And since February of this year, they've been listed as endangered nationally, and they're listed as critically endangered in Victoria. They've always been known to be rare here in Vic, uh, with less than 50 records accumulated over the course of the 20th century. And that was up until 1996, after which there were no further records for 19 years. Not one of these guys was seen. Uh, and there was concern that the species might be extinct in Victoria. And that was until one night in uh, 2015, Ecologist Rena Gabarov from Wildlife Unlimited was out in East Gippie doing glider surveys and she heard this frog call and recognised it to be different. So that's the Watson's tree frog. It's uh, a similar call to the related southern brown tree frog and the whistling tree frog which also occur in the same areas, but um, that call is quite a bit slower and lower than uh, the call of those other two species. So when you know what you're listening for, it's quite obvious when you're out there and you hear one of these guys. So the news was a significant discovery and it made newspaper headlines at the time. And most of what we know about the frog, uh, in Victoria at least, is based around these few known breeding sites. So since the rediscovery, we've got um, 43 sites with detections of this species, and almost all of them are places like this. Little standing bodies of water. Um, it's a pond breeding species, uh, so they will appear out of the forest and lay their eggs in and live as tadpoles in places like this. 
These are all places um, with recent uh, records of the frog. So these small standing bodies of water, puddles on the side of the road, ditches, um, rain filled logs, even these cut off barrels in the forest um, they will use for breeding. So on the one hand, they're really opportunistic breeders. They'll breed in any puddle that appears in the forest. But on the other, it's a pretty precarious strategy given that some of these places are um, vulnerable to drying up. Uh, they seem to be breeding peaks in the spring and the autumn, but they may breed year round after heavy rainfall. And we actually know next to nothing about the non-breeding habitat um, requirements of the species. The spatial ecology is virtually unknown. We don't know how far young frogs will disperse away from these locations. And we don't know how far the adult frogs might be moving from the non-breeding habitat in the forest to reach these places. So I'm going to just show a, few, a series of basic maps I made to illustrate the story of the frog since its rediscovery. So here we are in East Gippsland. These brown triangles show all of the historical records of the frog in the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas. So that was up until 1996. And then after the rediscovery, uh, targeted surveys led by Delphi East Gippy and Wildlife Unlimited, they tried to find as many new sites as possible. Uh, these little black crosses show all of the potential breeding sites that were identified for survey. Uh, they focused on roadsides simply to get in as many sites as they could. All identified sites were then surveyed under uh, suitable conditions using a standardised protocol of um, uh, listening, call playback and spotlight searching. Uh, 662 sites were found and surveyed that year, which resulted in a total of 21 new sites um, of the frog, which is shown by the blue triangles on the map. A couple of years later in 2019, uh, another broad scale survey was done and this time it expanded the search effort to the east and west, which you can see by more black crosses north of Buchan and between Can River and Malacuta. Um, 658 sites were surveyed that year, but uh, we only had detections of the frog at nine of those sites, so a really low uh, detection rate. Um, but we did have some significant new records northeast of Can River that year. But basically mounting evidence that in addition to the fact you know, that nobody saw the species in, for 19 years, um, we now know that um, it apparently occurs at low densities, it's patchily distributed across this forested landscape and its range in Victoria seems to have contracted the last few decades. Uh, and then before those surveys were even finished, um, the Black Summer fires burned through this huge area of East Gippsland, um, including over 85% of the modelled habitat for this species, and half of that was burnt at high severity. Uh, there have been a few rounds of post-fire surveys since then, which have focused on uh, the known breeding sites, but almost all of them have been surveyed. So I'll go row by row in the table here. Of the 30 burnt sites, uh, 18 of them have had the frog detected post-fire. Of the nine unburnt sites, seven have had the frog, and overall 25 out of 39 of the known sites surveyed post-fire have had um, at least one detection of the frog. And all of the three, three sites pictured in the bottom are, are known sites that were burnt at high severity. Um, these places clearly saw um, pretty high intensity um, crown consuming fires. Um, all of them have had breeding records of the frog post fire. Now how to interpret this, uh, although it seems that the, the tree frog clearly must be able to withstand uh, the direct impacts of the fire, of course we don't know what the uh, indirect impacts will be. Um, and they include things like loss of shelter sites, increased um, evaporation from losing canopy cover, which um, um, affects their aquatic habitat, increased sediment loads running off down the slopes, um, genetic bottleneck impacts potentially, um, and of course the cumulative impact of, of multiple fires one after another. And the only way of knowing really if these things are causing issues for the 
So the frog's persistence is, is going to be monitoring. Okay, so I'm going to move on to a recent project looking at the genetic diversity uh, of Watson's tree frog. So this was to inform DELP's genetic risk index, which aims to identify uh, candidate species for genetic management intervention. Uh, we had a pretty brief window for sampling, but um, all of the sites were visited in autumn of last year. Uh, we had some issues finding uh, many adults at that time of year, so we had to rely on a lot of tadpoles. So you can see uh, some of the field staff back fishing the tadpoles out of a roadside puddle last April, I think it was. Uh, but long story short, we ended up with 87 samples uh, submitted for sequencing. And it was a fortunate coincidence that at the same time, uh, researchers at the University of Newcastle were also investigating the genetics of the New South Wales populations. And so we were able to pull our data uh, for a whole genome SNPs data set from across both states. So I'm going to um, just, just touch on some of the main results from the genetics work. These are principal component analysis plots or PCA plots, and they show how all the samples in the data set cluster together uh, based on their similarity to one another. And one of the main results of the study was that uh, we can see that all of the Victorian samples over on the left of the plot in blue, they form this really distinct cluster, well separated from the other uh, populations in New South Wales. And the amount of variance explained by the uh, first PCA axis on the bottom of both plots is around 30%, which is very high. Um, so this is where these clusters are on the map. Um, so all of those dots on the map are uh, genetic samples of frogs, and the ones circled are the ones that appear on the plots on the right. Um, so we've got the New South Wales North cluster, a genetic cluster um, circled there, and the New South Wales South cluster in green, and all the Victorian samples circled in blue down here. So this is a, a fairly dramatic separation, and it's actually raised a question of whether or not the Victorian population could actually be a separate species or subspecies. Uh, but our working hypothesis is that this difference is, is likely an effect of genetic drift uh, due to small population size, low genetic diversity, and the, the degree of isolation from the New South Wales populations. So the main takeaway here is that the big population is, um, is isolated um, and there appears to be no gene flow between Victoria and New South Wales. Okay, on the genetic diversity, I've selected just a few key results to show. Uh, this is the number of samples in each genetic cluster that we're in our um, work so far. So we've got New South Wales North, New South Wales South and Victoria on the right. So not huge numbers, um, as it was a, a pretty rapid time constrained project. Um, and certainly sample size is a big caveat on all of this. <clears throat> um, we've got the observed heterozygosity uh, for each group, which is a measure of genetic variability within a population. Um, the possible values are from zero to one. So we can see that the genetic diversity of the Victorian population was approximately half that of the New South Wales populations. And then the effective population size estimate. Uh, so this is a measure of the genetically effective population size. And we can see that uh, in the New South Wales North cluster, we had um, estimate of in the hundreds of individuals which are contributing to the uh, genetic pool of the population. New South Wales South, it's down to the dozens, and in Victoria, the estimate was actually very low, between three and 21 individuals. So this is painting a pretty grim picture here. Uh, it's really spelling out that these frogs are in some serious trouble in Victoria, uh, but also that genetic rescue from within Victoria is unlikely to be a viable management option. It's already raised the question of whether or not we could consider increasing the genetic diversity of the Victorian population 
with translocations of frogs from New South Wales, but we first need to confirm the taxonomic status of the frogs in Vic, um, just to be sure we're dealing with the one species and then take it from there. Um, all right. I will touch on some of the acoustic monitoring that's been going on, um, just to tie into uh, Pete's talk earlier. So we've commenced monitoring of the Watson's tree frog sites over the past three seasons using uh, passive acoustic recorders. We use these little audio moths. So they can be programmed to record on a set schedule and can last for months out in the field. Uh, we started in 2019. Uh, that year we ran into the fires, so uh, experienced a lot of equipment loss, uh, a lot of units were burnt and lost, um, a lot of data. Some of the data could be retrieved, but a lot of it was lost. Uh, of the surviving data, we had the tree frog on eight out of 19 sites. In the past season, we've uh, ramped it up and we've managed to monitor at almost all of the sites. Um, this was with the help of the Southern Art crews doing fox baiting out in East Gippsland, so thanks to them. Uh, many of these have been retrieved uh, and are waiting to be analysed. Uh, but just to say, um, the work that's gone into combing through the, the acoustic data sets, especially the first one from 2019, uh, finding the Watson's tree frog calls and tagging them, have been used to train the um, the new AI model that's under development at ARI, um, and it has a really high accuracy in identifying the cause of this species. It's probably performing the best out of any of the species. Okay, finally, here are some of the uh, next steps that are um, either on the wish list or are actually um, planned for the coming spring. So we need continued uh, and adequately resourced monitoring. This includes acoustic monitoring of the known sites and also monitoring for um, the presence of chytrid, the amphibian disease, uh, which has been confirmed at a lot of the sites. We need to increase the sample size for the genetics, and we do have some planned work for that this coming spring. Uh, we would like to confirm the taxonomy of the Victorian population prior to considering any genetic mixing between Vic and New South Wales. We'd like to explore eDNA as a survey tool. Uh, the research into the spatial ecology um, is, is uh, a big knowledge gap. And i um, happy to report we now have confirmed funding from Delp Forest Policy for a radio tracking study this spring. And Zoos Victoria are in the planning stages for a captive insurance population. So those are just some of the things that are up and coming. I might leave it there, but um, just to say that uh, this has certainly been a very collaborative effort working with a number of these people and organisations. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Andy and Lou, for putting that together. And I do note that there are some questions in the chat for Lou, but given that she is sick, um, we may take those on notice or if any of our ARI scientists are able to answer those questions in the chat. Um, we can share those answers later on with people. But we'll keep moving on now.